So we were supposed to be in part three of The Last Dance, um, but we're not <laughs> because um, what we try and do at Mount Rubido is continue to stay relevant and current to what it is that's happening and affecting our nation. It's not that The Last Dance is not important. We are gonna get to back to that and finish that up, but I really need two weeks to be able to share what God has really laid on my heart, particularly with what is taking place with the death of Ahmad Arbery. I think that just opened up so much and just really uncovered and shone a light, shined a light on the, a, a circumstance and a situation that is continually to brew in America that I think if we really don't get a handle on is going to bubble out of control. And I believe that just we as a church are in such a unique position to actually be able to start to make impact and make an impact in this thing called racism, inequality, prejudice, and, and, and all anything along those lines that's taking place in America. So to be quite honest with you, um, I don't even know what we're going to call this sermon, like straight up. I don't know what we're going to call this series. I just know that God has literally opened up his word and has made his word come to life for 2020 with what was taking place with the children of Israel that I think is a direct parallel to what is happening with black people in America today. So if you have your Bibles, here's where we're gonna be in the book of Exodus chapter one. And we are going to start at verse five, Exodus chapter one, verse five. And so here is what the Bible says. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Fidim and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. And the Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and in bricks and in all kinds of labor in the field and all their labors which they rigorously impose on them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we just need you. We need you to unpack this word and may it not just inspire us, may it not just challenge us, but may we apply it and actually begin to live it is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, a lot of times when it comes to sermons, you try and come up with a, a really neat uh, way to try and draw people in, particularly with the introduction. And as I was sitting there trying to think of some unique way to introduce this topic, I have to be honest with you, uh, there was no cool story I could tell. There was no unique way or or, or nice little uh, illustration that I could use, except just to tell you my raw feelings. Um, unfortunately, seeing black men get killed on TV, in the news, whether it's at the hands of police officers or lynchings from the 40s all the way up uh, to the 70s, whatever it is, that's something, unfortunately, that I've kind of become accustomed to. We're kind of accustomed to hearing this on the news. As a matter of fact, we only hear about the ones that are recorded, but there are plenty of other deaths and murders that take place um, because of racism that we don't even hear about that if you pick up articles or you begin to Google and do some research that you'll find. So seeing this, uh, you know, hearing about it rather, I was like, okay, there's another one. I hate it. It, it. it sucks. It's horrible. But there was something different about this one that that just hit me in a different way. It hit me in a different way because not only did this 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 murder take place two months ago, but when I saw and heard about the circumstances surrounding this. It was almost as if there was some kind of boldness. And to be quite honest with you, you guys know uh, I'm into film. It felt Purge-esque. 
And if you never watched that film or that movie, The Purge, The Purge is pretty much where there, there really is not a lot of crime that is taking place uh, throughout the, the world, particularly I think in America is where the film is focused on. And, and, and there's not a lot of crime because they allow people for 12 hours, one night, a week, one night a year to be able to just purge themselves. And really, if you start to get into the film and purge themselves by doing all different kinds of, you know, the crime is completely legal for a, a 12 or 24 hour period. I can't remember exactly what it was in the film. But what is unique is that when you start to get to the bottom of the film, it's, it's very interesting that people use their purge, not simply to get stuff out of their system, but you find that it is a systematic way to eliminate a certain group of people. And so you'll find that there are racists in this movie, in The Purge, who are using this as an opportunity to get their racism out in a legal kind of way. There are individuals who are trying to get rid of the poor classes, and this is what they would do. So The Purge would be a lot of these rich people rounding up the poor people and literally being able to kill them and it be legal. And what I saw with the death of Ahmad Arbery at the hands of Greg and Travis, and I'm absolutely going to say those names because I don't want you to forget all three of them, is it felt like The Purge. It felt like there was some kind of legal entitlement for them to go play judge, jury, and executioner on a black man. And it seemed like it wasn't this kind of thing, oh, well, we were trying to just make some kinds of citizens arrest because y'all, let's just be straight. If there is somebody who was doing something illegal, pick up the phone and call the police. But they felt that they could be the police and not just that they could be the police, but they could be the police to a black man and that they could be the judge to a black man and the jury to a, ju to a black man and the executioner to a black man because they knew that once this took place, that they would not have any consequences or any repercussions. And for over two months, they had none. For two months, while a young man was dead and in his grave, they were at home enjoying quarantine and eating their food and being with their families and being able to celebrate all different kinds of milestones and talk on the phone to loved ones while a mother is sitting there with and a father are sitting there unable to be able to connect with their son because some individuals thought it was their right to take someone else's life. And in the words of what my, my man Kevin Carrington said, his life was not theirs to take. But it showed me that there's a deeper issue and that there's a huge problem that somewhere along the line, that when it comes to black people, people of color, that it is assumed that we are lesser than and that we have to respond to the whims and, and will of whoever comes to us. As a matter of fact, when we see our white brothers approach us, it's like they feel that there is a, 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 a kind of, of right that they have to question. And if we don't respond, we are in the wrong. It is as if I heard some individual saying that, well, why didn't he stop? They simply asked him, why should he stop? They're not the police. They are simply a bunch of individuals driving around in a truck with guns. What would you do? But when we look at what is taking place and what is happening, it has created fear, it has created anger, and it has created unrest. And if it is not checked, if it is not put together in the right context, and if we have not put the right things in place, I believe that we will see an explosion that this world has not seen before. And I believe that that's part of the job of the church, and I believe that's what I want to do with these next two sermons uh, as we get ready to dive into this subject. I want us to deal with what is happening in a solution. I don't want to talk, uh, you know, simply and spend all kinds of time dealing with what took place and complaining and doing all that kind of stuff. We've done enough of that. But now it's time to get to solutions. But sometimes in order to get to a solution, you've got to see the problem that has been presented before us. And one of the things that I think is so unique about scripture is some of the same things that we're experiencing today are some of the same things that the children of Israel were experiencing as well. And so what I want to do is I want to dive into just a few verses of Exodus chapter one, verses eight through 14, some texts that we really overlook that we kind of just slide into to get into the main story of Exodus, right? Because the main story of Exodus is about Moses when he's picked up, you know, from the river. But there's something that is lost there in those few verses that I believe once we on earth will give us exactly what we need to be able to move forward as a community. So in Exodus chapter one, we're fresh off the heels of Joseph dying. And if you're not familiar with Joseph's story, his history, and how we got to this point, 
Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers into Egypt. And so when he's in Egypt, here it is, this Israelite boy in a foreign land, and, and he is in slavery. But God is able to manipulate and work through Joseph's life in such a way, and I don't have time to get into all those specifics, but just read up on the story of Joseph. It'll blow your mind to show you that how the devil can mean something for evil and God can work it for your good, because all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. And Joseph's life is a shining example of that. But by the time that that we really start to see what happens and hindsight shows us that Joseph now has risen from being a slave in Egypt to being second in command. It's incredible what God has been able to do with his life. Now, what is huge about Joseph now being able to be second in command in Egypt and he's not an Egyptian, but now Joseph is at a table where he now has power and influence to actually be able to help his people, the Israelites. Because it is so important that during this time and what's taking place in Israel's history that they needed someone at the table who would be able to think about their needs as a people and who would not forget about them. And so the reason that Israel is able to grow and is able to prosper in this particular instance is because somebody who looks like them, somebody who understands them, is at the table able to make and influence decisions that won't just benefit Egyptians, but also will be able to benefit fit Israelites. And that's what I think is so important and what is missing actually from the black community in America today, that there are not enough, there are not enough people of color who are sitting at specific tables where decisions are being made that influence a majority in a wide range of different people. As a matter of fact, I'd like to suggest to you that we see this played out so clearly in what took place with the governor of Georgia when he made the decision to open up the state of Georgia. One of the things that we know that in Georgia, predominantly an African-American state, what we begin to see is that with this whole crisis of COVID-19, that over 80% of the COVID cases in Georgia are people of color. And not only that, but we see that Blacks are dying at a rate disproportionate to any other ethnicity when it comes to COVID. And so now when he makes this particular decision to open up the state, and I don't know if this thing was done on purpose or whether or not it was done in ignorance, but here's what we do know, that a decision was made that affected people of color. And I wonder how many people of color were there at the table. How many people were there to say, hey, sir, have you looked at these statistics? Have you seen what opening up the state will do to a group of people that you have been trusted to look for and care for? But you see, that's just the problem. When we are not at the table, people forget about us. When we're not at the table, they don't hear our voice because we don't have a voice. And so what we need to do is start to raise up people within our community to actually have a voice and seats at these key tables. Tables where policy is being made, tables where laws are being, are being discussed, ta tables where finances and budgets are made that are going to affect our community. But sometimes what we do, particularly as Christians, is we say getting in politics, that's not a Christian thing to do. Um, we, we need to do something else, leave that up to somebody else. But no, 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 no. We need somebody who looks like us, believes like us, who can sit at the tables and say, while you are thinking about doing this, have you thought about how it affects the Christian community? As a matter of fact, we can take this even further further. I was on a, a call with Governor Gavin when this whole thing started to, to come down. And it was just incredible to be able to sit at the table and let the governor hear the voice of the Christian community about how a shutdown would affect churches. But because I was at the table, there were different decisions that were made with a lot of us other pastors that were there. The point is we've got to get a seat at the table. And part of getting a seat at the table is preparing people for the table that they're going to sit at, that they're going to sit at. And so now the other thing that we still see about Joseph, which is incredible about him, is while he gets at the table, Joseph has overcome so much in his life. He's been a slave. He, he's been falsely accused of, uh, of rape for all intents and purposes. He has made it through prison. And now he is second in command in Egypt. He is living the high life. He's got a family. He's got kids. He's got everything that he needs. And so you would think that Joseph would just keep doing what he's doing, but he didn't. He did not 
allow his position to let him forget his people. And here's what I have to say to some of us who have quote unquote made it, who God has elevated to certain positions and where you now sit at different tables and now you have overcome and you're, you're making good money. You've got an incredible career. Too many times, some of us, when we get into the positions, we forget about the people. And that is what God is not wanting us to do. And he doesn't want to be a part of our experience that when he propels us to a new position, it is there not for you, but for his people. And so the question you have to ask is with the new position that God has given you, with the influence that he has given you, have you forgotten about the people? And I'm not just simply talking about throwing some donations out there. Praise God for donations. Those are awesome. Those are incredible. But when you really remember the people, you lift a hand, you open up a door so that somebody else can walk through. When you're in your position, don't forget about the people. I think here's the last thing I want to say about that. Some of you are wondering why you haven't gotten the position yet. Some of you are wondering why God has not elevated you yet. And I'd like to suggest to you that maybe it's because God knows that if you get the position, you will forget about the people. Because you will find out if you really care about the people, not when you get the position, but how you act before you get the position. And so if you're not about the people now, if you're not about opening up doors, if you're not about lending out a hand and helping people get up, then how can God trust you with more if you're not even being faithful with less? And so that's what's happening in Joseph's experience. He's been able to look out for the people, but then Joseph passes away. He dies. But Joseph says something. He actually leaves a command for the people. He says, look, y'all got to do me a favor. Make sure that my bones are not buried here in Egypt. And here is what Joseph has just done when he says this statement for the children of Israel. He's reminding them of a promise that God has given to Abraham. He's saying, look, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're not going to need anybody else. I'm going to give you your own land. You guys are going to have your own economy. You're going to flourish. Keep a pin in that because I'm coming right back to it. He's like, I'm going to give you all this. Now, Israel's not experiencing all of that just yet. But when Joseph says, don't bury my bones in Egypt, it's almost as if Joseph is saying a better day is about to come. And so even in the midst of Joseph's death, there still is hope. We might not have a seat at the table anymore, but at least we know where we're going to go. But now something interesting happens in the text. In Exodus chapter one and verse eight, it says that there arose a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. Now, at a surface reading of that text, it makes sense. Okay, you know, he doesn't know Joseph. Joseph is dead. And maybe even if you go a little bit deeper, you'll understand that that means that he, he didn't really respect, you know, what Joseph was doing and what he did, this idea of not knowing Joseph. But when you go a little deeper into this text, you find that there is something even more sinister that is being said when this idea of this new Pharaoh not knowing who Joseph is. First of all, let's say this from, 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 from plain to start. The Hebrew word for no is yada. And what yada does not mean is simply to know someone based on knowledge or uh, by reading about them in a book or maybe just meeting somebody for the first time and not getting to know them intimately. That is not simply what yada means. Yada is much deeper than that. And here's the reason why. Because we know that the Pharaoh, although might not have met Joseph, knew about Joseph. Anytime that you now take over a political office, not only do you need to know who replaced you uh, or who you're replacing rather, but who was the other parts of his particular cabinet. So absolutely the Pharaoh knew about a Joseph, knew some of the policies and things that Joseph did because he knew about Joseph. That was a part of the job, knowing who did what before you got into the office. But what the Hebrew word for your dot actually really means is this idea of an intimate knowledge, a, a type of relationship. And here's the other part of the word that got me. And y'all know that no in the Hebrew and the Greek is my favorite word in scripture. And I found something new about this word. But it actually also means to have a respect for humanity. That's this idea of knowing. And so when you put that definition into this particular text, here is what the Bible is actually saying, that there arose a new Pharaoh that had no respect for the humanity of Joseph's people. And when you start to think about that, now it makes sense why this Pharaoh was able to do what he did to the children of Israel, because he did not even respect the Israelites' humanity. And when I sit there and watch that video, of Greg and Travis 
running down Ahmad in a car with a shotgun and a magnum and being able to take his life and then simply go home without any kind of issue. There's only one way that people are able to do that. And that's when you don't have respect for a person's humanity. And here's how I want you now to look at racism. Racism is not simply this idea of you look different or you bring different stereotypes or prejudices to the table. Racism is not simply about color of skin or, 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 or texture of hair or just someone being different, but racism is when somebody has no respect for another person's humanity. And that's why if you start to look back over to what took place in slavery all the way up through Jim Crow and what we experience today, the reason that people are able to say what they say, do what they do, come up with the ideas that they come up with is because they have now dehumanized you in their eyes. You're not even a human being. They have no respect for your humanity. So what does your life mean? What, is, what, what do your rights mean? Uh, that's why in the Constitution, we weren't even a full person because they had no respect for our humanity. And so at the core of racism, what a racist person has going for them, as it were, is their complete lack of respect for another person's humanity. And we see it take place in the Holocaust and even, of course, in slavery. When you don't respect a person's humanity, you don't look at them as human. And when you don't look at them as human, you could do whatever, you could say whatever, and not only can you do and say whatever, but now you won't even feel because you're not even doing it to another human being. And that's the problem with racism. It attacks humanity. It doesn't just attack a color. It doesn't just attack an ethnicity. It attacks humanity. And here's the issue with attacking humanity. Racism isn't just an affront and an attack on another human being, but it's an attack on the God who made the human beings. You see, as a human race, we are God's prized creation. We are the apple of his eye. We are the ones that God sent his son for to be able to die for us. He died on behalf of every single human being, whether we accept it or not. And for any individual to try to take away my humanity, you are literally looking in the face of God and declaring unapologetically that God, you do not exist. And not only are we saying that God did not exist, but we're also saying that God, even if you did exist, you made a mistake. There's something wrong with this creation that you made over here. And that's why I don't look at them as human. And that's why I'll say whatever. That's why I'll do whatever, because they are not even human beings. And when we do that, we are attacking and we are cursing to the very face of God, the one who created us. And so that's why racism to me is so dangerous because it is not just simply what it does politically. It's not just simply what it does on an emotional or physical or mental level, but racism enters into the spiritual realm as well. And that's why it is impossible for you to be a Christian and racist because racism at its core actually denounces God himself because racism denounces another individual's humanity. And that's what Pharaoh did. He looked at the people of Joseph, he looked at the Israelites, and he said, y'all not even human. And so because of that, I'll be able to put anything I need to in place, treat you however I want, come up with whatever policies I can, because I'm not really doing it to another person. I'm just doing it to an Israelite. So Pharaoh, uh, you know, he doesn't look at them as human, but, but, but he has this, th th this fear. If you look at verses eight, nine, and 10, and the fear is, he's like, look, if we don't do something about these Israelites, they are all of a sudden going to become even more numerous than us. And not only that, but they're going to join with other nations. They're going to want to be able to, to take over us. And so we've got to do something. And so here is Pharaoh making these decisions completely and totally out of unfounded fear. Like there is no reason, there is nothing in Israel that would let him think that they are going to want to take over Egypt. And here's how we know, they had a promise of another land. The promise wasn't to take the Egyptians land. The promise wasn't to move them out of the way and to go to war. God says, I've got a place already set up for you. Y'all don't need to get these Egyptians. Y'all don't need to uh, connect with other people. I am going to be the one you need to partner with. I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna make sure that you are set and that you're good to go. And so in the mind of Israel, they have no plans of going to war with Egypt. They're not trying to do anything, but Pharaoh is operating 
out of an unfounded fear. And because of this fear, it is now affecting the way that he treats the Israelites. And as I start to think about people of color in America today, and particularly black men, it seems that there is this incredibly unfounded fear that individuals have of, of black people and blackness and in particular black men. And, and I want to say unfounded because there has been nothing that has been exuded that would say, yeah, we trying to take over or yes, we want to murder and we want to kill and we want to rape and destroy. There has been nothing that has been given off. There has been t places of, uh, of harmony where we want to be able to work together and live together as human beings. But there has been this fear that has been placed inside of people that every time that they see a black man in particular, and I keep hyping on that, you're gonna see why in just a moment, that there's something to be afraid of. And now because they're afraid of black men, now they begin to look different and they treat them differently. Uh, so much so to the point that we see that when, when, they, when they were brought over here, uh, when we were brought over here from Africa, there, there was this picture in their minds that, that people began to develop, that here are these animals, these big physical specimens that are stronger than us, that are bigger than us, that are darker than us, and they could overtake us, but yet they don't have the same moral compass as us. So we ought to be afraid when they come. And then they started to add this into film and movies where every single movie now, the black man is portrayed as this, as this domineering figure that will take you over. As a matter of fact, I just got to be real. As, 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 as up to cutting edge as Star Trek was uh, in the 60s, being able to break racial barriers and that they still couldn't escape certain stereotypes in the sense that the Klingons, who are the war munging uh, 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 race there, the, 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 the individuals who were about violence, they were the ones that were the darker race on the show. Not only that, but we see that even in political engagements and, and arguments, George Bush Sr., Willie Horton, you got to be careful. If this black man gets out of jail, he's going to rape your women and, and molest your children. Uh, he's going to steal your women. And so there's been this image that has constantly been pushed throughout society in music, in movies, in political ads that has created this unfounded fear that now even the color of my skin is a weapon. Now me being unarmed is just as, excuse me, even more dangerous, is more dangerous. Me walking around with my hands empty and just the color of my skin, I have become more dangerous than one of our white brothers who was in the state capitol in Michigan, armed in military gear with automatic weapons. People are safer around an individual like that than they are me. And it's an unfounded fear. It's an unfounded fear that has caused uh, individuals to make kinds of decisions where our brother Shane uh, Pish, our white brother Shane Pish, who raped a young lady, only got probation and had to register as a sex offender. Why? Because he was not viewed as a threat to society. But when you walk into Starbucks and see a group of black boys just hanging out waiting for a friend, the police is called on them. Why? Unfounded fear. It's the same reason why when we can be in a park and just having a wonderful barbecue that something has to be up and something has to be wrong. And so we'll call the police because they got to get out of here. Why? Unfounded fear. It's the same reason why there could be a black man who has been babysitting these three beautiful or two, excuse me, beautiful, precious white children for years. But when they see that, they call the police because there's no way that that black man could be in the car with those white children and there not be something going on. Why unfounded fear? And unfounded fear, I believe, also, and racism an evil and a disregard for humanity led Greg and Travis that day to look at this black man jogging and be fearful and say, there's something wrong with that picture. Let's go and take this man's life. It's fear. And that's what's happening with Pharaoh. Pharaoh is fearful. And so because he is fearful of what's going to happen, he begins now to institute some policies and practices to make sure that his fear, as unfounded as it is, would never come true. So Pharaoh says, we've got to deal wisely with these people or else they are going to multiply. 
Now, the Hebrew word there uh, for multiply actually can be defined this way. It's not just growing numerically, but it also means to grow in power. For all intents and purposes, reach your full potential. And so what Pharaoh's actually saying is, yo, we got to be careful. We cannot let Israel reach their full potential. And so Pharaoh is one of those who's like, you know, it's cool. They can, they can work and they can build up their land and they can do a little bit, but don't let them ever become more than what they are. Don't ever let them realize what their true value and meaning is. As a matter of fact, man, let them work in corporate America. Like that's all good, but don't ever let them become CEOs. I mean, let them be actors and actresses, but never let them be directors or the owners of the studio. I mean, let them be rappers and R and B singers and 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 perform before us, but don't ever let them own the record label or the company. Uh, let them be in politics, but don't ever let them become the president of the United States. I mean, let them work in the work field, but don't ever let them become owners of their own business. In other words, let them do their thing, but don't let them realize their full potential. And so Pharaoh's like, nah. We can't let them realize their full potential because of my unfounded fear. I've got to put something in place that is going to block them. So Pharaoh can't allow Israel to live up to his full potential, but he can't really just leave this up to chance. If he leaves it up to chance, Israel's going to grow. They're going to continue to, to, to make it. They're going to prosper. So what the Bible says is that in verse 11, that, that the, he's going to deal with them wisely. And so what he decides to do is develop a system. I need you guys to hear this. He wants to put a system in place that will ensure that Israel does not make it. So this is not something that he's just going to kind of sort of do. This is not something he's going to wait, sit back and hope happens. But he has literally organized and planned what Egypt is going to do and how it is going to run policies and procedures that would directly affect Israel. And we know for sure that it's a system because when you look at the Hebrew word for afflict are not, it actually means this to have authority and use it unjustly. Another way of saying that is an unjust use of one's authority. So the authority that they have to set the laws and rules and, and policies and procedures in place, they are using unjustly with the sole purpose in mind of being able to hold back the Israelites from being able to reach their potential. And when I look at people of color in America today, I can see that we are the recipients of an unjust system that was specifically and intentionally put in place to prevent us from being able to reach and realize our full potential. And this is not something that, 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 that we see accidentally happens, and it's not just a coincidence, because as you look, you can see specifically that when it comes to our white brothers, we are incarcerated over six times more than our white brothers and sisters when it comes to spending time in prisons. It's the new Jim Crow, as uh, uh, Michelle Alexander put. We also look at the, at the health disparities where we see that blacks here in America are dying of diseases and, and, and different things at, at different rates. They are dis, they're completely disproportionate, excuse me, to those of our white brothers because we don't have access to the same kind of health care. There are food deserts in our community so we cannot eat healthy foods where in other communities they have all the things they need to be able to combat these diseases in a natural way. We start to look at the employment opportunities where they did a recent study that found that a black man with an education has a less chance of being able to get a job than a white man with a record. And all of these things are part of a system. They're part of a system that is put in place that does not want a certain group of people to be able to move forward. Now, here's the thing that some people are saying, I know what you're doing. You're trying to blame all of the different problems and excuses that, you know, problems rather than issues that people of color are having on the man or you blame it on the system. No, no, no. It's not blaming the system or excusing uh, somebody's uh, ability to not make it or be able to go forward, which I'm going to get into in just a moment. But here's what we have to do as a people of color. And even if you are not a person of color, you have to recognize that this is the system, that the statistics do not lie. 
It is not equal. The opportunities are not there as they are for everyone else. And here's the one thing that, that, that I've learned, that as people of color, you have to work twice as hard to be able to get half as much. That when you go into the job opportunity, you don't just have to nail it, but you almost have to be perfect. And we have to recognize that there is a system that's stacked against us. And right now we can't change the system. And so what we have to do is be better than good. We have to be better than great. And if that's what it takes, then that's just what it takes because that is the system that is in place. And while we're working on that system and trying to get seats at the table to be able to change, we've got to take it upon ourselves to say, you know what? It's stacked against me. It doesn't want me to realize my full potential, but I'm not going to let that be an excuse. I'm not going to let that drown me out. If I got to work harder, I'll work harder. If I've got to do more, I'll do more because I will not let a system stop me from realizing the potential that God has put inside of me. And that is why when you see a person of color being successful, you've got to recognize that they have not just overcome regular human adversity that sometimes all of us go through, but they've also overcome a deck that has been strategically stacked against them to prevent them from having the seats at the table, to prevent them from being the doctors, the lawyers, the CEOs, the presidents of the United States, the governors, and the mayors. Anytime that we have made it in this world, we have had to overcome far more because there is something something put in place that intentionally wants to stop us. And that's what Pharaoh did. He put a system in place to try to stop Israel from being great. And that's why, what's the lingo today? You just don't want me to be great. Yeah, that's true. They don't want us to be great, but it's not up to them. It's not up to a system to determine our greatness. It's up to a God who lives within us, who can help us overcome any adversity in any circumstance, even an unjust system. So what did this system actually entail? There was a lot of things. Of course, you're going to say, of course, it's slavery. We know that that's what it was. But there's something so specific that is mentioned here in the text where it says that Pharaoh inflicted them with hard labor. This idea of hard labor. And, and when you look at the Hebrew word for hard labor, it can simply de be defined as this. Um, hard work that is not commiserate with the right amount of pay. In other words, they are working hard. They are, they are burning themselves. They are breaking their backs and they're getting paid. I need y'all to hear me. They are actually getting paid, but they only have enough just to stay at a certain level. They're never able to experience economic freedom, they're never able to build on their own. They're just able to get by. Israel at this point is now the system that they're getting ready to put in place just allows Israel to live day by day, hour by hour, and moment by moment. No planning for the future. No being able to, to pour into another generation and be able to get, uh, uh, you know, to live and experience prosperity. Now, here's what's so interesting about this idea of hard labor. And this is the word that's used, particularly when it comes to economics. When you look at Deuteronomy 28, and some of us don't like to read this, but I challenge you to read it. God is making a promise to Israel. Now, they've already come out of slavery at this point, but it lets you know that this is what God had in mind for their future. And in Deuteronomy 28, the first part of that chapter, God breaks down the financial prosperity. I need y'all to hear this, that he is promising Israel that they are going to be economically free. They are going to be the lender and not the borrower. They will have their own land. They, and now they're going to be selfish. They are going to be an example to other nations. As a matter of fact, they're going to be so rich and they're going to be so blessed that later on the queen of Sheba sees what Solomon is doing and how he is financially blessed, how his kingdom is all in order and all of the financial economic blessings that they have, how they're not selfish with it, how they give but still have more, how they are so uh, generous but still seem to have everything that they ever need. And, they, and Queen of Sheba wants to check that out and see what's going on. So God had every intention on Egypt being blessed, excuse me, not Egypt, but Israel being blessed economically because God understood that if they had their own land and they had their own businesses and they supported themselves financially, they wouldn't have to rely on any other pagan nations. And so what God wanted to do was build them up as a people economically because he knew that that was also a way for them to experience freedom. Now, what I want to do is I have to read something to you. I, 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 I'm not going to try and, and come at it from memory, but I came across this article in my research in preparing for this message 
because we're getting closer to, I think, the solution that we need to have as a people. And this article talks about what has taken place economically within the lives and experience of Black people in America and how that has contributed to where we are not in society today. So I want to read that to you. It's going to pop up on the screen. And I'm just going to go ahead and read that to you guys right now. The Black community is at such a disadvantage economically that it has caused ripple effects that has just crippled us. Juneteenth Emancipation Day, 1865, was supposed to start a new era of Black wealth creation. After 12 generations of being subject to slavery's institutionalized theft, 4 million African Americans were now free to earn incomes and degrees, hold property, weather hard times, and pass down wealth to the next generation. They would surely scramble up the economic ladder, if not in one generation, then in a few. But eight generations later, the racial wealth gap is both yawning and growing. The typical black family has just one-tenth the wealth of the typical white one. In 1863, black Americans owned one half of 1% of the national wealth. Today, it's just over 1.5% for roughly the same percentage of the overall population. The cause of that stagnation has largely been invisible, hidden by the assumption, y'all listen to this, of progress over the end of slavery and the achievements of civil rights. But for every gain Black Americans made, people in power created new bundles of discrimination, largely hidden from sight, that thwarted again and again the economic promise of emancipation. See, that's why we're talking about that idea of systems that are created. And this article is going to talk a little bit more about some of those systems that when, when, when slavery was done, they had to institute some new ones. And here's, here's what it says. The article continues. It's a common misperception that the racial wealth gap is an unfortunate legacy of a bygone era. The myth goes like this. Slavery and Jim Crow bred black poverty. In the 20th century, millions of black families moved out of the South, chasing high wages in urban industry. But after a few decades, the factories closed, inner cities decayed, and a complex tangle of pathology emerged in single-parent households and soaring incarceration, incarceration rates. If those were the causes, then the solution seemed evident. End job, housing, and school discrimination, enforce civil rights, and sprinkle the market with affirmative action. If those things failed to close the gap, then the problem was one of the follow was one of follow through. If black people would just move to the suburbs, marry, finish school, train up, and play by the rules, the gap would vanish. But that is a myth. Concealed in what uh, 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 Teshi Coates terms the quiet plunder. In the grand narrative of freedom and civil rights, the disadvantages that persist are invisible precisely because people in power continuously innovated new forms of discrimination. And so what ends up happening is now they get to this place where they see that black people have a way out. They have a path to be able to get economic freedom. They're able to grow, get their education, get their jobs, own homes. And so what they decide to do is say, no, 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 can't let them be mighty. Can't let them be great. Just like Pharaoh did. We've got to create new systems, but we can't do it with Jim Crow because that literally looks wrong. We can't do it with slavery because no one in their right mind would let that happen again. But what can we do? And look at what they came up with. The nation industrialized between the 1870s and the 19, and 1910s. But instead of vanishing, the disadvantages confronting black Americans simply morphed. Slavery's violent theft was replaced by convict leasing, leasing sharecropping, and after a heroic civil rights struggle between 1863 and 1873, disenfranchisement and legal discrimination or Jim Crow. When African descended people began to move into industrial cities during and after World War I, they faced surcharges on opportunities, high rents, and new forms of prejudice. As a matter of fact, Kelly Miller says this in 1930, the Negro was up against the white man's standard without the white man's opportunity. African Americans seeking home loans found themselves redlined, in, ineligible for credit because the government would not guarantee the loans. Housing costs rose without giving black residents a stake in the value of their homes, while neighborhoods decayed from lack of investment. Real estate professionals and developers acted hand in glove with racist lending policies, hemming black families into neighborhoods where disadvantaged compounded one another. Low quality schools and services in poor neighborhoods were a drag on upward mobility. 
Since housing equity makes up about two thirds of the medium household wealth, excluding black Americans from establishing equity during a time of unprecedented rises in home values, locked in and exacerbated wealth disparities. And this is why when you look up wealth disparities, they set up the rest of the disparities within the African-American community. And listen to what we just read. If I don't own a home, then I'm not able to have the wealth that I need because owning a home, all of us know, for those of us who do own homes, that's a huge part of our wealth. But then if you do own a home, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make the neighborhoods around you so bad that now if you try and sell that home, it's not going to have enough value. And so you can see systematically there has been things put in place to stop us from achieving economic well-being so that we are able to now crack the ladder to be able to build and become the people that God has intended, not just for black people to be, but for all of us to be. Because no matter what ethnicity you are, Deuteronomy 28 applies for you. But there are a group of people that say, no, we want Deuteronomy 28 to only apply for me. And so what I'm going to do is make sure that not that we make the pie bigger so that everybody or, you know, can have a piece of it. What we're going to do is we want to keep the pie not only the same and maybe in some cases grow it bigger, but we want to make sure that you don't even get a piece of it. And that is what has happened to the black community. And that is why we are crippled. And we'll even talk a little bit more about it. That's why we can't afford insurance. And when we can't afford insurance, we can't go to the doctor. And when we can't go to the doctor, the diseases we're not able to deal with, when we don't have the right food. There's one person that actually, actually said that when it comes to a, a black family in America, they have two choices to make out of three options. Child care, you gotta put your money towards child care, rent, or groceries. But you can't just pick one of those, two of those three. You need all three. But because of our economic disparities that are taking place within this country, that is why we've been unable to live out Deuteronomy 28 and be able to experience these incredible promises. So this is the plan that, that, that Pharaoh has. His, his plan is, is, is to be able to set up this system, put it in place, have them experience economic hardship so they will not be able to prosper. They will not be able to advance. And this is what Pharaoh has in mind to do. But even with all these plans being put in place, the children of Israel, with all of the plans of hardship, with the system that's going to be put on them, the Bible says that they continue to multiply. And remember what multiply, you know, of course means, right? It, it means in the Hebrew uh, to, to be great and to continue to, to continue to grow. And they're doing all this, but here was the problem. As they multiplied, verse 12 also lets us know that they were scattered. And because they were scattered, it is now that Pharaoh is able to institute this system and it's able to work. It is now that Pharaoh is able to put all of these plans in place and is able to now subjugate them, put them in slavery, and completely change the course of their history until God, of course, through Moses, has to be able to intervene. Because here's what was happening. They were multiplying. They had the numbers. They had the people. They had the potential. They had everything that they needed. The problem was they were scattered. They were scattered economically. They were scattered spiritually. They were scattered relationally. And that's what I think is happening to black people today in America. We are scattered. We have all kinds of potential, but we're scattered. We're all over the place. We're not supporting each other. We're not, we're not really operating like a community. We're, we're sometimes like crabs in a bucket, right? Like we, we see one go and, and, and we're hating on that one and we're pulling someone down. When we make it, we don't put a doorstop inside of the door of our success to allow someone else to go through. Sometimes we'll give people good advice, but we don't need people to be mentors anymore. We need sponsors. I need somebody who's going to talk on my behalf, somebody who's going to take me where they're going and propel me further than them. We are scattered. We multiply, but we're scattered. We have potential, but we're scattered. And I'd like to suggest to you that the solution to what is taking place in this nation today is for us to stop being scattered and now start to operate as a people. To get together. And I'm not going to get into you saying, Pastor, it's so philosophical, it's real esoteric. That's 35,000 feet because that's where I'm at right now. I'm at 35,000 feet. The principle of us as a people just making a commitment 
that we're going to support each other, that we're going to, we're going to get together. Now, next week, when we come back here to preach, um, we're going to, we're going to talk about what that specifically looks like. But here is the word that we have to understand. It's the word together. We've got to stick together. We've got to support one another together. And that looks like supporting each other's businesses. That looks like being sponsors for individuals. That looks like helping and creating job opportunities for people within our community because nobody else right now is. Some of you are saying, Pastor, that's, that's, that's crazy. It's a little selfish, right? Like, like we shouldn't you know, be doing that. You know, we got you know think about you know other people and that and that kind of thing. Other you know other people first. Why should we be looking at this for our community? You know, I, I fly all the time. You know, now you can get a plane ticket, forty dollars to travel all around the world. And there's one thing that is said on every single flight that I'm on, every single flight, that if it, if there's ever an emergency, one of these little doohickeys is gonna drop like you know like this. You know, it doesn't look exactly like this, but you know the mask. And what they tell you to do is they say, look, you're going to have people next to you and they're going to need you. They might be your kids. It could be your mother, your husband, your wife. But before you fix their mask, you've got to fix your mask first. You got to put your mask on first. Before you do anything else, make sure your mask is secure because if your mask is secure, then you'll actually more effectively be able to help somebody else. And one of the things I think has happened so many times as a black community is we've tried to secure everybody else's oxygen mask. We try to make sure that everybody else is good and set and, and to a certain extent, maybe that was for a certain time a good thing, but right now our community is hurting. Right now our community is suffering. And what we need to do is not be afraid to create opportunities for us to be able to grow because we recognize that if our mask is on first and our mask is secure, then we'll be able to branch out and be able to pour into so many other people in the way that I believe that God wants us to. Look at what he did with Israel. He said, before you can help any other nation, I've got to first make you a great nation. Before you can reach out to others, I need to make sure that you are secure. And that's what I believe that we need to do. Not to the extent where we're exclusive, not where we're saying we're better than, not where we're kicking other people away, not where we're degrading anybody else's humanity, but where we make a conscious effort to support one another, to pour into one another, to uplift one another. And next week, I want to talk to you about that because I believe that if we can do that, then when situations like Ahmaud Arbery take place or any other kind of racism that isn't acting on us, we're gonna do more than march. We're gonna do more than get on Twitter and Instagram. Heck, we'll even do more than preach a sermon. But maybe we'll be in a financial, maybe we'll be in a spiritual, a physical, a mental and emotional place where we can actually do something that's not just gonna make a difference for the moment, but that's gonna make a difference for not just this generation, but the next generation and the ones that come after if God should delay his coming. And so that's my challenge for us today, together, to be able to do this together. And maybe there's somebody here who's under the sound of my voice who's saying, you know what, God, I've been trying to do life alone. I've been trying to do it by myself, independent of you, but I'm recognizing the promises that you have for me. I'm recognizing that you want to be a huge part of my life. You want to be my life. Uh, you know, I'm seeing God that, 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 that outside of you, that, that I can do nothing, I can't move forward. And you've been working on my heart but today I finally surrender. I throw up the white flag and I just want to give it completely over to you. Where I want to ask you right now, if you're watching on Facebook Live, yeah, I want you to take the next step in your journey. I don't know where it is. Maybe some of you, the next step is Bible study. For some of you, the next step is being a part of an online group. For some of you, the next step is, is maybe volunteering. Or maybe the next step is for somebody getting ready to get baptized, whatever it is, there's a link right there in the comment section that's been pinned on our Facebook Live. I want you to go there click on that that link it's going to take you to our next step page and let us know what your next step is we'll help you facilitate it if you're watching on our mount rubido live i just want you to look up and as you see up you're going to see a little tab on the top of your page that simply says next steps and when you click on that i want you to let us know what's your next step because we're honored here at mount rubido to take those next steps with you on your journey with jesus christ and as we all begin to take these next steps together we'll continue to step until we get to this place where we finally can truly embrace that there is no Jew, that there is no Greek, 
that there is no black, this, there's no white dad, there's none of this. We're just all a part of the family of God as human beings that are all saved by the blood of Jesus. And it just so happens that the blood that Jesus shed looks just like yours and it looks just like mine. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for potential. Thank you so much for a promise. And God, we have to start living that promise. We've got to start living it because I believe that living in the promises that you laid out for the children of Israel are the solution to what's taking place in this nation today. And it's not tribalism. It, 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 it's not ethnic tribalism, as, as some would say. It's us being able to support a group of individuals who are hurting. And right now, the black community is hurting, God. We're just hurting because we feel that on every side, it just seems that there are things that are just against us right now. But if God is for us, then who can be against us? And God, there's a way that we can support each other. And again, not to be being exclusive of anybody else, but God, we've got to build up each other. We've got to build up this community. And when we put our oxygen mask on first and when it's secure, I believe we'll be able to reach out and we'll be able to connect and do some things in this world that have never been done before. So God, I pray for Mount Rubido. There's some things that we have in place right now, specifically that we're working on, that we believe is gonna be able to make a difference in communities. Not just acts of charity, but, but things that move statistics and, and, and change some of the things that we even talked about today. We believe we can do that. And it's gotta start within our own church. It's gotta start within our own church. And that's what we want to be able to do. And we'll talk more about that next week. God, I pray for those who have made decisions today. I pray that they would be inspired to take that next step and that we would continue to handle their decisions very responsibly as we know that we are honored and privileged to be a part of their journey with you. And then God, as we go throughout this week, keep us safe, keep us in your care because we can't wait to be able to not only do the work for you, but we can't wait to work for you in such a way that when you come back, you'll be able to look at us and declare, well done. So we love you, we praise you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you so much for joining us today here at Mount Rubido. Um, I know a little different, uh, but we're in different times, so sometimes it calls for a different kind of message. We're going to be in the same kind of vibe and experience on next Sabbath, uh, where we are going to be delving into a part two. Maybe I'll come up with a title for that series then. But as always, I want to thank you for joining us. For those who made decisions, you're going to get followed up with immediately today. And we're so excited and thankful for the decisions that you made on your journey with Jesus Christ. I want to thank all of those of you who have supported us with your financial gifts, with your volunteering. As a matter of fact, um, as you finish watching this broadcast, I'm about to go out uh, and go down to the church so we can continue to pass out some more food and continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So again, thank you so much for joining us. If you have joined with us for the first time, if this is on, you're watching our Saturday broadcast or our Sunday broadcast, thank you so much. Like and share this, subscribe to our YouTube page. Also, we want you to join our Instagram, follow us on Instagram and follow us on Facebook so we can let you know what's coming up. But not only that, we've got fresh content that we constantly want to pour into your life to help you on your journey with Jesus Christ. So as always, thank you for being with us and continue to keep loving, keep growing, and keep serving.